Well, good, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've come to talk about, as it says, public perceptions, public opinion, and attitudes towards energy. And as you might tell from the already from the title page, uh, it's going to be mainly European. Um, I've still got one more week to talk about the UK and Europe. So it's good. Um, so public perception and attitudes towards energy. It won't concentrate too much on what the present attitudes towards energy are. It's more on, to a certain extent, how they've evolved, where they do evolve, what might have changed them, and things like that. The daily, today's attitude towards energy is different from what it was, of course, some time ago, and it has changed for different reasons. So it's not particularly what it is now, it's how people look at, and it is perception, I can't stress this too much, it's people's perception. It's how they perceive energy, it's not necessarily factual. It's, it's how they look at it and what their feelings about it are. This is the content, I'll talk about the Eurobarometer, which is the basic survey which is used for this. And then talk a little bit about what issues that Europeans are concerned about. This is to try and put energy in some form of context. Okay, what should the EU priorities be? Then I'll talk energy and environment and public opinion. And then a question about energy policy in Europe. This is a, a unpopular subject in some ways. Europeans in energy, growth of environmental concerns, how things have changed over the years. Climate change and carbon dioxide with a question mark. Electricity and nuclear energy issues, which is another reasonably hot topic, drawing some, some conclusions, not too many, and then talk a little bit about environmental impact assessment, strategic environmental assessments, and a thing that many people have never heard of called the Aarhus Treaty, which is, must not be forgotten, it's a very important piece of paper. The Eurobarometer, the surveys I'm going to talk about, are done by the European Commission and they've been undertaking public opinion surveys regularly since 1973. The first survey was in 1973. And it's all done face-to-face -face interviews. It's not done by telephone, it's not done by ticking boxes in a, on a piece of paper and sending it in. It's all done face-to-face -face interviews with 1,000, around 1,000 people in each of the member states, except some of the smaller states when it goes below 1,000. Uh, and some of the bigger states it goes above a thousand, but approximately a thousand people in each member state. And they're from randomly selected people. Randomly selected. It's very scientifically done randomly. Uh, and so it gets a very good cross-section of the views of a country. So it's scattered throughout the country, it's scattered throughout different sexes, different uh, employments, uh, different levels of, levels of education, different ages. And the interviews take place over 10 to 15 days. So all the interviews take place within the same period in each country. And they cover all sorts of major topics. There are standard interviews which take place twice a year and cover a range of the major topics and also special Eurobarometer surveys which use the same technology, the same techniques, the same thousand people as the standard surveys, though they may not cover all states. There are one or two examples of special surveys here which do not cover all states. And I'll explain why is that at the time. But they, they have covered specifically energy, energy, nuclear safety, radioactive waste management, carbon capture and storage, all sorts of energy issues as well, of course, as environmental issues and climate change, and, of course, many other topics as well. And all the Eurobarometer data here is from the standard or special survey, so at least a 1,000 people in each state that's been surveyed, and in most cases, it's all the states of the Union. So nowadays, the standard surveys interview 30,000 people in the space of 10 to 15 days throughout the year. There are also flash surveys that are done by phone and studies which are done in uh, focus groups, but I'm not going to use the information from these. Each survey is really a mine of information. 
And uh, I, if people ever want to do a PhD on public opinion, I would say the best thing to do is just go and get hold of the Eurobarometer surveys, one of them or several of them, and you can don't have to do any other work other than analyze that data because there's so much data that never analyzed because there's so much of it because it's all collected as well as people's opinion on the subject that we also know what their sex is, what their age group is, what their education level and income brackets, occupation and their opinion leadership role whether they live in a village, in a town, in the country, countryside. So we know all this about every person we interview and all this information is available for each survey. And of course it's been done over the last 40, more than 40 years now. So there's a lot of information on some of these topics stretching back for 40 years, twice a year, the same question asked with over 40 year period. Not all of the questions are the same every year of course, which gives us some problems, uh, especially in the energy sector and the environment sector when you're looking at very specific sectors the changing questions uh, are quite something that we come across all the time and make life a little bit difficult. Examples of output. What are the views of the future of the European Union? This is, we ask these people, so this is over the last eight years, the different surveys taking place over the last eight years. And the blue line is the people who are optimistic about the future and the red line is the pessimistic about the future and the green line of the don't knows whether they're optimistic or pessimistic. Okay? The, the UK numbers are given in the bottom corner on the right hand side and in uh, 2015 the number of people who were optimistic was 46% uh, opposed to the 44% who were pessimistic so the majority in the, in the UK are, are, are optimistic about the future of the EU in 2015, in November 2015. These are the most optimistic states, though. These, you show you the regional variations. The regional variations are often very marked in these surveys. Between Ireland, for example, 76% optimistic and 20% pessimistic, down to the Czech Republic, where the majority are pessimistic. There's also socio-economic variations which I say sometimes we study in some detail, sometimes we've, we've never got round to doing, there's just too much information. If you look at the socio-economic variations, the females are more optimistic than the males. That's in the UK. It's not the case in Germany, of course. In Germany, it's the, the, the males are much more optimistic than the females. The age, the younger people tend to be more optimistic about the future of the European Union than the elder, older people, two to one, 68 percent to 33 percent, with the two age differences. Those who finish school early tend to be less optimistic about the future of the Union. Those who left school late are more optimistic. So, just to give you an idea, it does vary tremendously from country to country, between inside the country, between different social groups between different ages, different sexes. So there's a tremendous amount of variation, sometimes there's a tremendous amount, sometimes not much. So any, when you look at answers to surveys, you need to know all these things, the location, the sex, the age, the education, the profession. All this needs to be known about, otherwise your data could be totally skewed. How much of the growing pessimism, you saw in the graphic a little while ago, and the sudden increase in pessimism about the EU, how much of that was caused by the world economic situation? And then you've got the upswing that started again in optimism. But then at the end of the 2015 survey, there was a sudden drop again. And because I think this was the survey was conducted during the same, t the, the attacks in Paris, the November attacks in Paris, were during the time the survey was being conducted throughout Europe. And I think that's possibly a cause for the downswing of the optimism. Such factors make interpretation very difficult. Okay, it's, it's the case for I think any time you're doing a public opinion survey, and, and interpretation is a hazardous. And as I said there, it's all about perceptions and impressions, smoke and mirrors as much as anything. People's opinions are not necessarily based on facts.
So am I, in fact, in many cases. What are Europeans concerned about now? Well, if you look, immigration is the biggest concern in, in November 2015. It's not just in the UK. Of course, you've talked a lot about immigration in the UK in the last few weeks because of the Brexit the, and because of the next week's vote, next week's referendum. But it's throughout Europe, immigration is an issue. It's the main issue for Europeans at this moment in time. And tourism is the second largest issue in Europe. Not just the UK. The numbers for the UK are there. So you see UK is 61%. The European average is about 58 for immigration. And for tourism, the UK is 34, but it's on about 25 or something for the rest of Europe. So there's a trend in the similar in the UK as elsewhere in Europe. So it's not just the UK that's worried about immigration. Everybody is. And it's an issue that, you, that Europe must do something about and is hopefully doing something about now. You look at the environment, energy supply, and climate change, and these are not clearly not major issues for most people. And this is an important point. People are not that concerned about the environment, about energy supply, and about climate change, relative to other things like taxation, crime, inflation, immigration, financing, unemployment, the economic situation, which was the main issue until the last year or so. The economic situation was the main concern until uh, the beginning of 2015. Then it became the so-called immigration and terrorism took over. So it does change quite quickly. It changes by local events and regional events. So, but energy, environment and climate change are not major concerns of the people. However, of course, if you ask people about specific issues on energy and environment, they will have an opinion. They always have an opinion. And it's clear that environment and, and energy issues are not a major concern, but they do give you an opinion if you ask. And quite often a strong opinion. They can be very strongly negative or even strongly positive, but mainly strongly negative about things like nuclear, about carbon capture and storage, radioactive waste management. They have strongly negative views on some of these things. But in general, they're not concerned about the energy sector. Hampton Court 2005 was a European Council meeting at which Tony Blair, as it says here, moving away from traditional British scepticism about common EU energy policy or about any common EU policy, Tony Blair called for coordination to tackle climate change and improve security of supply. And he asked for a number of things and proposed a number of things. And this was interpreted as being the beginning of the European Union's drive towards a common energy policy. So Tony Blair, the, U the UK were the ones that was proposed the common energy policy for Europe. At the beginning of 2007, 61% of Europeans supported a common energy policy, um, and then it actually grew to around 73% in 2014. It fell back slightly at about 70% in 2015. The UK is somewhat weaker against it with only 56% in favour but only 31% against it. So there's still a strong pro-energy European energy policy even in the UK if you ask amongst the different people. There's some regional variations you can see from Malta with over 80% once is in favour of the common energy policy down to the Czech Republic with only 50% in favour of a common energy policy in the UK is, is towards the bottom end, but still if you look at the in favour compared with against, you'll find that in every state there's a majority in favour. In some places the majority is very large in favour. Questions on energy have often played a prominent part in Eurobarometer surveys, surprisingly because uh, it's not a big issue for a lot of people, but it's been in Eurobarometer surveys right from the beginning. 
and uh, it included a common, energy, common policy on energy supplies right back as far as 1974. And there were 73% of the population didn't think we were doing enough community-wise for energy at the time. We had a special, first special Eurobarometer on energy was undertaken in 1982. Now this had some fascinating information such as the 33% of households in Luxembourg are dishwashers, where only 5% of the people in UK are dishwashers. And also, but we had a lot more colour TVs than anybody else. With 83% of the people had colour TVs already in 1982 in the UK, whereas only 13% in Greece. Now, I find these numbers quite fascinating, but I'm not sure what it tells me about energy. Uh, but I thought you might be interested to see the differences between the member states are very strong, and they remain. Prolonged breakdown in supplies of oil and gas was seen as the real concern in 1982, but only by 23% of the population, compared with 57% thought environmental pollution, environmental pollution was a bigger concern, 66% employment, unemployment, and 71% were more interested in rising crime and tourism. So the issue of oil, the issue of oil supplies and gas supplies were not that much of a concern relative to other concerns of the public. The majority of the 1982 special survey was actually de devoted to asking people's views on nuclear power in Europe. This was followed by a flurry of surveys on energy, specific surveys on energy, and there's, there's I think seven, of, uh, seven and more further ones and several of the questions were not repeated from one survey to the next, or they were asked in a very different form, so it's very difficult to compare the numbers. Unfortunately, uh, in the Commission, it's, you probably find between one survey and the next, we'll get a change of staff. You'll have, everybody will have their own ideas as to how these answers should, questions should be asked. They'll draft something else, then the Eurobarometer people have a chance to modify it because they want it to not lead the people with, to an answer. And so by the time you finish from one survey to the next, there's often not much comparison. However, there were some questions that were, elite, that were repeated over a short period of time, and these are the ones. And which energy source is stable in terms of price? Which energy source? Now, the majority of people thought it was natural gas. Now, stability of natural gas prices is of great concern to the oil and gas companies as well as to anybody who uses gas for their central heating and, uh, and also gas producing their electricity at the, at the electricity stations, at the power stations. Because we all know, I think now, that gas prices fluctuate quite strongly, especially those that are linked to the, gas, to the oil price. When the oil price rocketed up, the gas price linked, with the, the linked to the oil price also went up a great deal. And even the ones that are separate from the oil price, separate contracted from oil prices, also have been very variable. At the moment, it's nice and low in some areas. In other areas, it's not. If you're in a place like the States, the oil gas price is very low at this moment in time. Therefore, it's reasonably going to be reasonably stable over the future because of shale gas. But that's not the case in Europe because our shale gas production will probably never be enough to influence the price dramatically. But the surprising thing is the nuclear energy is not regarded as a stable price, where it is probably the most stable uh, price for electricity you can possibly manage, uh, produce. And um, renewables were increasingly thought to be uh, more stable in price. More stable certainly than solid fuels, oil, and also nuclear. Fortunately, the stability of price of renewables is actually on coming, the price of renewables is coming down and they're getting more stable, but it's still not down to the stability of solid fuels, of course. Which energy source is reliable in terms of supplies? And again, we have natural gas. Uh, I, people don't know, of course, that the majority, the largest supplier of natural gas to the European Union is Russia. 
by far. Uh, and they, but they think renewables will be reliable in terms of supply. It's in te talking 10 years time, so this was talking the last of the surveys, they were talking about 2005, 2006, so which renewables were not uh, the most stable in terms of supply in the year 2006, or in fact before then, and uh, they're coming more stable now, uh, because there are more of them, we are connecting them into the grid better, but there's still going to be some time before they can be regarded as the most stable uh, form of supply. But people, of course, don't know this, and they say you work on perceptions and impressions. And they hear about renewables, and they hear a lot about renewables in the press, and because of the money given to renewables by governments, and people always talk about renewables, they don't talk about their natural gas, they don't talk about their nuclear supplies particularly, unless there's a big fuss about them, about somebody building a new plant. But there's always talk about renewables, and therefore people regard these as reliable. Now, this one they got the answer right, which energy source involves the lowest risk of pollution in 10 years' time? Well, that almost certainly will be renewables in most cases. Uh, the rest of them are all very low. Natural gas comes above everything else, above uh, nuclear, above uh, fossil fuels, and above, uh, above solid fuels, and also above oil, which is probably fair enough. It's less polluting than oil and solid fuels, certainly. So that was the one answer they get right. But again, they hear that renewables doesn't cause any pollution, doesn't cause any pollution. It's a message they keep getting time and time again. And so the impression is correct in this case. So natural gas is seen as increasing uh, stability. Uh, renewable energy is seen as the lowest source of pollution. Solid fuels have been the big loser over time, uh, both in terms because of price stability, which is, uh, I would say, nonsense in many ways, because oil and coal in particular is probably the most stable of the prices uh, from the point of view of uh, raw product. A raw, raw material um, and the security of supply. It's got probably got better security of supply than both uh, oil and natural gas, and probably even more so than renewables as far as availability goes. Nuclear some support because of Chernobyl. You probably saw with the the, the uh, terms of supply. Nuclear has a big dive at one point in time. It dips down, and because Chernobyl was in 1986, and the, the nuclear has kind of fallen off favour from 1986 onwards. That's it. Yeah. But the regional and time variations are really quite marked, and there are major differences between member states. For example, in 1984, 25% of the Irish thought that solid fuels offered the lowest risk of pollution. Okay, 25%. That was the, while only 4% of the Dutch thought that solid fuels offered the lowest risk. 4% of the Dutch thought that solid fuels offered the lowest risk of pollution, whereas 25% of the Irish did. In fact, the Irish thought solid fuels were less polluting than renewables. Well, 60% of the Dutch thought that solid uh, renewals were less polluting than solid fuel. By 1996, the views became much more homogenized between the two. But it depends when you look at the data as to what the answers you're going to get. I said we took out questions about nuclear power stations. And here you see the impact of Chernobyl. And you see between 1984 and 1986 when it suddenly goes up because between those two surveys there was the Chernobyl accident. And therefore, suddenly, nuclear became an unacceptable risk. Then it improved again. And it came down to 1991, 1996, and we came back to wanting renewable nuclear becoming more worthwhile. It changed again after Fukushima, though we don't have the same sort of data 
following the Fukushima accident, unfortunately. Showing the fact that people don't really know much about energy and just have impressions of it, there's a survey carried out in 2002 on energy and it looked to the future. It looked at the future options, energy options and technologies for the future. And because it was looking at the future, it included several questions about nuclear fusion. Interestingly, many people thought fusion would contribute significantly to global warming. So we expect fusion to contribute to global warming and produce as much radioactive waste as today's nuclear power plants. Well, neither is the case, but people thought that it did. In spite of this, however, fusion was seen as likely to produce the most useful energy by 2050. So people expect fusion to produce and let be less expensive than, than coal, oil and fission by 2050. Now, I don't think there are many people who will tell you that fusion is, ever going, not, is going to be uh, commercially available of producing significant quantities of electricity by 2050. Certainly not enough to impact on the site, on people's um, consumption. It's going to be very small amounts from the research plants still. Nothing else. But the public believe it will be the second most important source of electricity by 2050 after renewables. And they also thought it would be working in 2022. 13% thought nuclear fusion would be meeting our requirements by 2022. So people have no real concept about fusion and its future, what it, waste it does or doesn't produce, and what its future will be. But they've heard about it, and therefore they give their answers accordingly. We did a special EB on energy in 2050, 2005, sorry. But the questions were very different by then because suddenly people had woken up to greenhouse effect and global warming and it had now become known as climate change. And by 2005, its strong links to energy were already established. So energy policy in Europe was never going to be the same again because it always had to take greatly into account environment. We always looked at the risks of pollution, the least polluting energy source, but the most important issues for a long time were the price and the security of supply. Now, suddenly, after 2005, the issue of climate change became as an important as issue, if not a more important issue, as when you talk energy, than security of supply and the price of energy. There are growths of environmental concerns may interest you as well because we started off, we did our first environmental survey in 1982 and people were asked to look at, at diff there are different perceptions about specific issues. They had six issues, local issues, six national issues and three world issues to look at. I'm not going to go through these, I don't think it's going to be that interesting to you. But locally, 64%, they said they weren't worried at all about the environment. They had no problems with their local environment. So that's the main people that had no real problem. But looking at nationally, they were more, they, the most important thing was damage to the sea and beaches by oil tankers. Okay, this, is the, this was the big issue in 1982. Whereas Air pollution came down at 69%, it's still quite high, but not as, not as important to them as disposal of nuclear waste, already in 1982. On a world scale, it was depletion of the world's forests and extinction of certain species. Those are much more important to the population than climate change due to carbon dioxide. Similar answers in 1986 and 1988. So there was slight changes but even so, the damage caused to sea life and beaches was the most important thing on a national level. But 
but it varies again regionally. Just an example, Italians and Greeks identify the environment protection as a serious problem, while only 56% of the French and 56% of the Irish regard it, they regard it as more of a problem for the future than something that needed to be addressed immediately. We had a whole series of special barometers on the environment, and together with some on, on climate change in recent years, we've done climate change as a special eurobarometer. Unfortunately, many of the questions tended to change from one report to the next, as I said, and this is, this is a problem you face if you work on eurobarometers. I've worked on a number on energy and also on nuclear, and even on the carbon capture and storage one. Um, but there are occasionally interesting little series uh, what causes serious damage to the environment? This was a question asked by the environmental people and they just give them a list of possible topics. So you can't just come, come along and give your own example. You've got to tick a box. And you're allowed, in this case, to answer as many as you wish. You can identify everything if you wish. This is why the percentages, of course, add up to much more than 100. You can identify as many as you wish. The most important thing were factories releasing dangerous chemicals. And then oil pollution of the sea, you see, and nuclear waste storage. That was, those are the, these are the issues. But greenhouse gases were already in, uh, uh, in 90, 92, 95, and 97, together with the ozone layer, of course. Because I think the ozone layer was probably at that time more of a concern to many people than the greenhouse gases in the 90s. So at that time that was the case but this is where people thought were causing uh, damage to the environment but it was factories releasing dangerous chemicals was the number one issue the, the 97 survey was the last one that grouped ozone with the greenhouse gases after that we did it separately and as you see 1999 the ozone layer 86% thought it was important while only 76% thought that climate change was so as Still, at the end of the 90s, ozone layer, uh, damage to the ozone layer was regarded as much more important than greenhouse gases. In 2002, we had a new list and put out a whole list of things that people could choose from. And of this one, the most worried came to nuclear waste. Nuclear power was 50%, whereas climate change was down at 39% and still about the same score as ozone layer, damage to the ozone layer. So even in 2002, climate change was still not much of an issue. You're not worried about it from the environmental view. Now, as I say again, if you ask people, people are not generally that worried about the environment, energy, climate change as an issue, unless you ask them. But if you ask them, they suddenly can either be worried or very worried, or not worried at all. So they will have an opinion if you ask them for one. But they don't have an opinion unless they're asked, if you see what I mean. So it's asking the question pushes them to form an opinion in many cases. So you've got to be very careful when you ask questions that you're not already kind of prejudging and, and getting the answers you want. Nuclear power and radioactive waste are the top, and you see the list of them down there and how low climate change is on the list. But again, Big differences. Greece, 63% thought climate change was a big issue. 21% in the Netherlands thought climate change was a big issue. Chemical products had gone down to 38%. 2007, 2004 to 2007, climate change was suddenly the top issue, with water pollution second. So you had a big change. They'd taken radioactive waste out of this survey, thank goodness, because I think there was a separate there was a separate survey done on radioactive waste. So it was taken out of the survey, so we can't compare them. But you'll see the differences now. But now climate change is the top issue. However, by 2011, climate change has slipped down the list slightly again, with man-made disasters topping the list. Um, it changes. However, Air pollution came out at 57%, which was the top issue. Again, big variation between Hungary. 68% thought climate change about air quality. 47% of Irish and Estonians worried about air quality. Big differences. 
but possibly geographical. The Estonians and the Irish have a lot of coastlines, so they have winds coming in off the sea, they're not too worried about uh, air pollution so much, whereas Hungary lives in a totally surrounded landlocked area with pollution from all around it as well as internally, and therefore is considerably more worried. And we also did them on climate change. As I said we started in 2008, 2009, two surveys, 2011 and 13, and we always asked about the seriousness of climate change relative to other serious problems. And there we came, not surprisingly, poverty came the number one issue in every survey, but climate change was also very high on the list. It came either second or third in most of the surveys. Major economic downturn came highest for some reason other than 2013. And that was surprising because in 2000, the major impact of this, of course, was in 2008, 2009. By 2013, we'd already got relatively used to major economic downturn. In fact, it was starting to look better and people were starting to worry about it more for some reason. Regional variations. Poverty, 91% of Greeks, 57% of Latvians, 70% in the UK. So there's massive regional variations again. Economic situation, we're in 88% of the Cypriots, 27% of Swedes. Climate change was a big issue for the Swedes, but not for the Estonians. International terrorism was the main issue for the Maltese, but not for Slovenians. So much difference, so much difference between one state and the other. I say, but remember, when we look at environment, energy supply and climate change, we're only talking of a relatively small percentage of the population that are concerned about. Impact of carbon dioxide on climate change. An important issue in people nowadays, I think, will say, well, of course, it's obvious. No, it's not. These are questions, do you agree that carbon dioxide only has a marginal impact on climate change? Nearly 50% of the Dutch thought that carbon dioxide only had a marginal impact on climate change. The UK, over 40% of the people here, only think that CO2 has a marginal impact on climate change. For some reason or other, the Bulgarians are the ones who disagreed most with that statement. Big variations between 50% and down to about 10%. So people don't really know the impact of CO2 on climate change in many countries, some countries more than others. In 2011, we did a special Eurobarometer on carbon capture and storage. We, we tried to establish whether people were knowledgeable about it. 67% didn't know what carbon dioxide was, CCS was. And a further 18% had heard of it, but didn't know what it was. Okay, so that's 85% of the population didn't know what carbon capture and storage was. Only 10% actually knew what it was. Okay, 10% knew what carbon capture and storage was. But people were worried about it. When we had, they added explain to them with the question, face-to-face -face interviews, you then explain the next question will be on carbon capture and storage, and carbon capture and storage does this, it's when we capture the carbon out of things, pump it under that. Why would you be worried about it? Negative impact of health on the environment, 64%. This is on carbon capture and storage. 63% are worried about leaks while the site is in operation. Carbon, car carbon dioxide coming back out of the site where it's being stored. 39% worried about the transport of the carbon dioxide to the site. They could answer as many answers as they want, but risk of terrorist attack even was in there. Now, we had a different EB survey, 
And then again, you'll see environment and health come to number one. Leaks come to number two. And transport is the third one. The numbers are a bit different, but here people only have one option to pick. So these numbers do add up to 100%. So you compare between the two surveys, survey A and survey B, and leaks from you know, health, energy and environment, health concerns of, for both of them. Yeah? What I haven't told you yet is survey A is carbon capture and storage, survey B is radioactive waste management. So they have identical, near identical concerns because you've got to take into account multiple answers are available for the first one or only single answers for the second. The similar levels of concern, exactly level, similar levels of concern for both storage activities. While one is storage of very large quantities of gas, with the other is storage of very small quantities of solid material. But exactly the same words. What is carbon dioxide then? Half the people interviewed correctly identified it. CO2 is carbon dioxide. 75% of the people in Poland knew that CO2 was carbon dioxide, but only 54% of the people in France. Younger people were better informed than the older people, 63% to 39. Level of education, of course, was a big difference. And the social staircase, as it calls it in the survey, I don't know why, but uh, or depend where you are on the social ladder, you are, you are better informed about what carbon dioxide is, but a lot of people did not know what carbon dioxide was. And its impact on climate change, another question about it. Do you agree that CO2 has a high impact on climate change? And there you go, Greece, yes. Down to Finland, no. How much of your electricity comes from coal and renewables? Many people have very little idea where the electricity comes from. Very little. 39% of the people in the UK, so that's four out, of, 4 out of 10, 2 out of 5, thought that more than 10% comes from renewables. Because there's a lot of talk about it, of course. The actual percentage is just over 5%. In Finland, 48% thought that less than 10% of their electricity came from renewables, whereas they actually get 30% from renewables in Finland. So people just don't know. In Poland, 76% knew that more than 10% of their electricity came from coal, which is not surprising because it's 91% comes from coal, but 27% still thought they got more than 10% from renewables when it's actually 3%. Over 40% of Romanians, Bulgarians and Italians said don't know to this question. Not the where our electricity comes from. On the other hand, 10% of Czechs said we don't know, but most of them were wrong when they gave their answers. So, they don't know. We asked people what the alternative energy options might be in addition to coal and existing renewables. You've got coal and renewables in your country. What out of these other alternatives have you heard about? When you look, solar, yes, a lot of people have heard about solar PV. Nuclear fusion, a lot of people have heard about it. Then it goes down, biogas, geothermal, ocean energy, nuclear fission, less than nuclear fusion, even though nuclear fission produces 30% of the electricity in Europe, nuclear fusion produces none. But a lot of people have heard about fusion, but not many, fewer people have heard about fission. Hydrogen energy is quite well up there. So a lot of these issues I, people have not heard of, but other pe some things people have heard a lot about. Okay, we asked questions about nuclear energy. This is a, a pet topic of mine. I was involved in a lot of these surveys. And this is one of the most divisive issues on energy, of course. And we asked what are the expected benefits? Do you agree that a decreased dependence on imports is a benefit, more competitive energy prices benefit help against climate change? And we ask these questions, and as you see, a lot of people will agree that it makes you less dependent on imports, the benefit of nuclear. 
that various from 87% of Swedes down to 45% of the Portuguese on dependence on, on reduced dependency. Competitiveness. The Bulgarians thought nuclear was competitive, give you more competitiveness, 72%, Austrians 36%. Helps against climate change, 73% of Swedes, 29% of Austrians believe it helps against climate change. Nuclear energy does not produce any carbon dioxide in its operation. None at all. So it's probably, the, together with renewables, is the best way to defeat climate change as an energy source. It's the only energy source. As I'm fond of saying, it's the only energy source that can produce electricity 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 52 weeks a year, and not produce carbon dioxide. Fifty-one percent think the risks outweigh the benefits of nuclear. The risks are too great for Greeks, the Cypriots, the Austrians, the Luxembourgers, the Danes. Not surprising, none of those have nuclear. And Spain it does have nuclear. But several member states think the other way around, with Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, Sweden, the UK, Slovakia and Finland, all believe nuclear benefits outweigh the risks. And these are all countries with nuclear energy, of course. So they have experience of it, and they believe the benefits outweigh the risks. Those without have the opposite view. Spain, uh, it's a very sensitive political topic in Spain, it's very much politicised in Spain. And there's a very significant male-female divide on these questions. Males are always more in favour of nuclear than the females. Higher education tends to perceive more benefits, but also perceives the same level of risk as the, the lower people, lower level of education. Nuclear waste perceived as major risk. This is probably perceived as the major risk of nuclear power most of the time. Just after Chernobyl, nuclear safety became the big issue, much more so than radioactive waste. But then nuclear safety kind of died off as an issue and radioactive waste remained higher, it went, went even higher. Um, and overwhelming people think we need to do something about it now. Now, not leave it to future generations, we need to do it now. But try and do it, it's almost impossible because the public object to you doing it. They think you should do it now, but as long as it's not anywhere near them. More than three quarters of the population think there's no safe way of doing it. 83% of the Greeks don't think it's a safe way, and 52% of, to, down to 52% of the people in Malta don't think there's a safe way of doing it. But they are poorly informed. Nearly half think that we still dump nuclear waste in the sea. We haven't done that since the 70s. There was sea dumping of radioactive waste in the 70s. It's not been done since. Two-thirds of the people think we export nuclear waste for disposal in other countries. Nobody is allowed to dispose of nuclear waste for disposal in other countries. And 70% think that deep disposal sites are already in operation, which is rather surprising, seeing we don't have a single one at the moment. Over half the people would wish, but however, over half the people would wish to be consulted and participate in the decision-making process concerning a repository in their area. So if you have a repository, you want to be consulted, participate in the decision-making. Countries in favour of nuclear energy, those are the ones in favour with the European average is 44% uh, in, about nuclear energy, are you in favour? The average is 44 and those are the countries with greater than 44% and includes the UK with exactly 50% in favour and about 40% against and 10% don't know, I think it is. But all those countries in favour, without exception, uh, they all have nuclear power. But the public feel poorly informed. One in four people feel they're well informed. Only one in four think they're well informed or fairly well, or are fairly well informed about nuclear. But half said they're not informed at all. Uh, the, the half said they're not informed, and the other 25% said they're not informed at all. So one in four says we don't know anything, we've not been told anything. 
two out of four say we don't really feel informed at all, only one in four said they're reasonably well informed or well informed. 28% of Greeks think there are nuclear power plants operating in their country. There's never been a nuclear power plant in Greece. And 24% of Italians believe they've got nuclear power plants operating in their country, and they closed them immediately after Chernobyl. And there was a big vote about it, and it was a decision to say they close it, and they're still closed. And but 24% believe it's still operating. So they don't really know about it. They're not well informed. There's no doubt about it. They're not well informed. Two in three citizens feel they're insufficiently informed to form an opinion. And most people get their information on nuclear energy from the television, 72%, newspapers, 40%, and the internet was 23% when we asked this survey. But I think that's because it's been 2011, I think. So I think they, they expect that percentage to have increased now, the internet percentage. The poorest in form are most likely to react negatively. That is the case in a lot of things. Uh, nuclear energy causes least concern in the countries where options have been well discussed and debated and a firm, clear decision taken on the way forward. I.e. they don't have to, they prefer it not to have to rely on them to take the decision about it. They have a government, if the government comes out strongly in favour and takes the decision to do it, then they tend to come round and back the government decision. And my, but my personal feeling after reviewing all the information is the public are not in general that agitated about the issue of nuclear energy. They're not that agitated about energy at all, or climate change, or the environment, and possibly even less agitated about nuclear energy, or no more agitated about nuclear energy than anything else. It's only when you ask them, and then you get the strong opinion. Drawing conclusions from the data are a difficult task and give very misleading ideas. And I hope this is the main message I've been trying to get across. If you look at data from these surveys, you've got to be incredibly careful about how you deal with them. They can give you very misleading ideas. And you've got to look at a lot of factors to see what might have influenced that decision on that, that period in time. They're time dependent, they're sex dependent, they're social status dependent, they're education dependent, and it depends what the newspapers have been talking about most recently and what programs have been on the television in the last few weeks about something. So these Im have major impacts, and from time to time they can swing quite widely, wildly. public are not generally well informed about energy issues. They don't know much about the subject. That's clear from every survey we've done. Any is energy issues, they have very poor knowledge of energy issues in general. Now, they will say, always say they want more information, but I think in this day and age, saying they want more information is rather a strange thing because they have access to information. The vast majority of people will have access to the internet, and you can find out anything you want about it. So I'm not sure how much in activity we need to do in informing people about energy issues in general to try and influence the public opinion. If they want to be influenced, if they want to form an opinion, they can find out the information. So I don't think we need to focus too much on informing the general public on some very technical issues I don't think is, is time well spent. But they often form strong opinions frequently based on negative perceptions of very unrealistic assumptions. So be very wary of these. Strong opinions formed on the basis of negative perceptions and, um, or unrealistic assumptions. They think they know that renewables are these form of a polluting form. They also, it's true, but they also expect it to be the cheapest. Many people believe we produce more electricity from renewables than we do. We think nu they think nuclear fusion will produce as much waste as nuclear fission and will be available in 2020 and produce more of our electricity by 2050. People have heard of nuclear fusion, but fewer have heard of nuclear fission, while the latter produces 30% of our electricity supply. People think that both nuclear technologies contribute to climate change, though neither do. 
people think that CO2 released from a storage site would be worse for their health and environment than what we do with it now. So they worry about releases. The main problem, release from the storage site, is going to come out and up my health and environment. But at the moment, we just pump it straight into the atmosphere. It doesn't matter. If it comes out of a hole in the ground where we put it, then it's going to be more dangerous for you than we're just pumping it straight out the chimney. I can't think so. But people believe it's the case. Don't know why, but this is what they do. People think we still dispose of high-level radioactive waste in the sea and export it to other countries for disposal, so they really do not know much about energy. They do not know much about energy. But they want to be informed, they tell you. They want to be consulted, and they want to be involved in the decision-making process when it comes to any new facilities, especially in their area. Which brings me on, briefly, to the environmental impact assessment and the strategic environmental assessment. Both of which, hopefully, you know about. The environmental impact assessment was first adopted in 1985 at a European level. It's, it's also, it's, it was put into, it's in UK legislation like all other European directives. It's been transposed into UK legislation some time ago. In fact, a, a lot of this information, a lot of these uh, directives have a base in, in UK legislation. They're based, uh, some of them are based on UK legislation to start with. It covers a wide range of projects in the energy sector, amongst other things, including any new power plants, radioactive waste management, carbon capture and storage. It also covers uh, building new pylons for pet transmitting power and things like this. Anything that has an impact, significant impact on the environment. The Strategic Environmental Assessment, the SEA, was adopted more recently in 2001. And this requires for any new strategy by a public authority. It could be a government, and it could, or it could be a local authority, but as long as a, a public authority, you have to have an environmental, it, that could have an environmental impact. You've got to do a plan or a program which has got to be reviewed with the competent authorities in the member states. This assessment must, I mean, an assessment must be done. Failure to do this will bring you in trouble with the law. The UK failed to do this when, it's, when Tony Blair launched the new nuclear initiative, and Greenpeace took the UK government to court because they hadn't done a strategic environmental assessment of the impact of a new nuclear program on the UK, and it delayed any activities on new nuclear in the UK by two or three years, which probably cost millions, if not billions, of pounds. So beware. Fail to do this at your peril. And then there's the thing called the Our House Convention, which usually the majority of people have never even heard of. Which is a pity, because it has three pillars. It concerns the right of everyone to receive environmental information that is held by a public authority. That's what you have the right to do. So if you want to know some environmental information about anything in the UK, you can go to the environmental agency and say, I want this information. This is about the environment. So you have right of access to environmental information in the UK. And elsewhere in Europe, if you live elsewhere in Europe. You have the right to participate from an early stage in any environmental decision making. This is the public has the right to participate from an early stage in environmental decision making. There's no ifs, buts, and in fact there's no geographical limitation on your right to participate. You don't have to live next door to where they're building a repository. You can be live up to 500 kilometers away, but you have a right to participate. And you have a right to challenge in a court of law public decisions made without respecting your right to receive the information and without being consulted. So if they don't consult you, you have the right to challenge it in a court of law. And this is, gives you the, this is the third pillar of the Aarhus Convention. So if they don't consult you, they don't involve you in the decision making, you can take them to court. The consequences, because the combined 
environmental impact assessment and the strategic environmental assessment directive are combined with the convention, with the Aarhus Convention. In law, so these are legally binding, the concerned public, and the concerned public stretches, I say from, it can be 500 kilometres away from any site, you've just got to say I'm concerned about this, doesn't matter where you live, must be informed about any plans, programmes or projects that impact on the environment and given adequate opportunity to participate in decision making. Should the, and they should be regarded by governments and industry, and I stress this, as an opportunity to talk to the public. Opportunity to dialogue with the public on the energy and environmental issues that are facing the project. It offers the possibility to correctly influence local opinion on projects and topics. And in my view, looking at the public opinion throughout Europe, in my view this is far more important in many ways than public opinion on a wider national or regional scale. It's much more important to look at the local opinion as far as projects are concerned. Though I must unfortunately admit that public opinion in Europe often has far too great an influence on political decisions and policy. So basically that's about it. We, pub we public opinion, the public always has an opinion. We cannot really live without it. The public always has an opinion. You have an opinion on all these issues as well. We all do. It has an important influence on our lives. The public opinion has an important influence in our lives, especially through its influence on politicians, policies and political decisions. But we often fail to understand public opinion. And we sometimes struggle, we try very much to influence it. And more often than not, we fail to influence it. So please be very, very careful whenever you try to interpret it or use it. That's it. <laughs> if there are any questions, I'd be more than happy to try and answer them. Get the slide back on. Hi, my name is Elder. Um, just wondering, uh, do you have any data on fracking? I'm trying to think whether we've done any surveys that cover... I can't remember any recent surveys, because it must be recent, that, would, that has covered fracking at the moment. I don't think there is. Not a public opinion survey throughout Europe. I mean, there are, there are local ones that have been done, of course, in different regions and things, but I don't know whether you... Right, thank you for a very interesting talk. I think the thing I've taken from this particularly is, is the huge variability of the data, not only between different countries, but perhaps more worryingly, the lack of information of all the general public. Uh, although I have to admit, I'm sure if it was in other areas, such as medicine and other areas, I probably wouldn't know very much about that either. Um, but this poses a problem, doesn't it? You say quite rightly that public opinion is important. We live in a democracy. How should governments decide what they should do particularly when the public policy is against them? Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I mean, you asked the... You ask, we ask questions for public op these public opinion surveys and you get answers just to try and find out what the public are thinking about something. And then, of course, they're promptly, these sort of surveys are promptly used by others uh, to, perform, to produce policy. And you... This is why I say you've got to be very careful when you interpret it and how you use it. Very, very careful. And so if you put out a public opinion survey, say, you know, 90% of the people in the UK hate the idea of fracking, the government's probably going to come along with a policy to ban fracking in the UK. And, and it depends on your, how your survey is collected, who you're asking, if you're asking people around a certain area who are against it, other areas will be for it. So it, it's a very difficult thing to do, and this is why it's got to be very carefully used. And 
And if you get answers which complicate uh, political life, then it's, this is a problem. I mean, nuclear, people are against nuclear, and you look at why they're against nuclear. They're against nuclear because of ma managing radioactive waste. It's, it's the number one issue with, with anti-nuclear views is because of the waste issue. But people don't have a clue about storage of ra radioactive waste. They have no knowledge of how it's done. But they're against it. Why are they against it? Because it's not been done. There's a lot of the reason is that people are against it because it's never been done. And therefore we don't believe it can be done. So they're against it. Then you use that and you convert that into an opinion against nuclear because that's, it follows that it's, this is the main reason people don't like nuclear. And so it goes back to the politician as people are against nuclear. Therefore we won't have nuclear. And then that, that comes reinforces the public opinion that nuclear is a bad thing because the politicians are against it. But the politicians have been influenced. So this is a vicious, almost a vicious circle that you can't break. Once it starts, it just builds up. And, and to get out of it is, is very difficult. Now, I say that you saw it with, new, with radioactive waste management. People are against it because of health issues, blah, blah, blah. But at the moment, we, it's on the surface, all this waste. It's in just a building. I mean, would you rather have it sitting in a building, or would you have it rather have it 800,000 meters underground, when you've got all that much rock between you and that, plus wrapped up in all different sorts of things? It'd be much safer down there than on the surface. But people don't <laughs> will argue against the disposal site, and just the same with carbon dioxide, CCS. You're you're against it because of possible leaks, but at the moment we just release it all. We just pump it all into the atmosphere. Why is the worry about a small amount of leaking out of a out of a storage site? When so, so it is very difficult. So ask them if they like CCS. Ask them if they what they believe on nuclear, and you get a negative view. And the politicians therefore adopt a negative position. So, this is why I say you've got to be very careful when you try and interpret it. And I think you've also got to be very careful what questions you actually ask. Because if you get the answer which is going to create political problems for you, better not to ask the question. And they, in a democracy that sounds a stupid thing, isn't it? Don't ask the people what they think or want because they might give you the wrong answer. And then you're stuck with it. Well, we might find that soon anyhow. Yeah. I'm just following on from that. I mean, it, it is a vicious cycle. If public opinion is based on misinformation and cherry-picked science, and then government policy is based on public opinion, it's, it's never going to work. <laughs> the government has got to recognize when public opinion is based on misinformation and deal with it at source and not try and form policies based on it. Cherry-picking of science has got to be, uh, I mean, it's a kind of internet related problem, I think. It's just getting worse. The more information that's out there, the easier it is to get access to the bit you need to back up your argument. And that seems to be the, the malaise, that rather than studying something in depth, you just look for the bit of information that's appropriate to what you want to believe. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. It's, it is very difficult. And, and I'd say that there are certain things I'm not sure uh, that you should ever um, ask the public uh, if, if you're going to use the information to form policy. And, and you know, radioactive waste is one of them, CCS is another one. Uh, it, it's, it's a stupid question to ask them, you know, because you yeah, will, they, they, they won't think about it. You know, if, if, if you're just doing it, they won't actually think about it. But if you ask them whether they want it, they'll probably, they might react and say no, because they will think mm, there's a problem, there might be a problem. So when they give a negative view of no information or too little information or just incorrect perception. Mm. Uh, and so it's, it's, just, it's not right to ask the public to give an opinion on something they know relatively little about, uh, because you will get the wrong answers uh, and you'll finish up with the wrong policies because you asked them a, the wrong question at the wrong time or something. It, 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 it's, it's very difficult. This is why public opinion, I say, you, you kind of handle very carefully and keep in a lot box. Um, I'd like to thank you. Um, I'd like 
I was thinking, surely the, the problem is not really only the public opinion, because in most cases, the public is not really asked their opinions when decisions are made. So the problem is more the opinions of the politicians that is in some cases misinformed as well, or in some cases informed, but still have so strong opinions that they don't care about the facts. So, I mean, we shouldn't blame the public for not, for not knowing enough or not being misinformed, because in most cases they don't decide anyway. No, I, I, I pers well, personally I don't blame the public for not knowing something. And there are lots of questions that I would say I don't know or I have the wrong answers to. I, mean, there's, there's, I think that's the case with everybody on this. Always something you don't know a lot about. So, it's, so I shouldn't be asked on these subjects. It's probably best if I wasn't asked. The, but the public, when they're asked, gives an opinion. And, they, and I'm not saying their opinions aren't honest. They're honest opinions. I mean, but they're not based on good information in many cases. The politicians shouldn't then take these opinions as kind of, you know, this is what we must do because of this. But there's a very brave politician who'll say, you know, the public are against nuclear energy, so I, I'm going to support it anyhow. You know, you're not going to win votes. So the answer is going to be, well, I'll go with the public opinion because that's what's going to win my votes, regardless of what I, whether I think it's not a bad thing or a good thing. If you feel strongly about a subject, you'll probably be willing to go against public opinion. But the majority of politicians don't feel strongly about anything. Uh, and they, they, so they're quite happy to be. They will be influenced by public opinion. I mean, I, it's a flippant remark. Uh, but, I mean, I've known enough politicians through my working with the European Parliament and things like this. And, and they don't have time to form opinions on a lot of these subjects, but they have to vote. So they just... They're just going on and impressions. What the public think? The public are against it because of this. Well, I'd be against it. It's, it's, the, it's an easy way out to in many ways, or it's the only way out in some cases. But it, I don't, so I don't, you can't blame anybody for it, but it's, it's the wrong way to do it, I think. And I said that the best way to stop it is the right at the beginning by not asking the question to start with, which is difficult to defend in a democracy. I also have a question. So in the um, second pillar of the Amos uh, agreement, is there um, uh, some indication on how the public should be informed about the project that is uh, going to be planned or proposed? Because probably this might be how mm. to inform appropriately the public to form an opinion. It's, it's all, it's, these are directives. These, these are what's called a directive, a European directive, when the, when the Aarhus Convention is put into the Environmental Impact Assessment. The, the treaty itself, the Aarhus, the Aarhus Convention is, is, a, is not a legally binding convention on its own. It's a convention, it's kind of to encourage people to do things and to do it in the right way. It's, it's something internationally people agree to, but taking a country to... Uh, to the courts because they didn't do everything in the Aarhus Convention may be a bit difficult. But in the European case, we enacted the Aarhus Convention into European law together with the Environmental Impact Assessment. So we have a directive now which, which incorporates the Aarhus Conve Convention into Environmental Impact Assessments. And that is what requires people to do the consultation and the decision making. However, directives at a European level, are kind of given a general target. And you, you have to consult and you have to involve them in the decision-making process. That is the, what the directive will say. How it is to be done on a member state by member state level tends to be left up to the member state to define exactly what the consultation process and the decision-making process will entail. So it, while, while the European directives set targets, set levels of what you must achieve, how you get to those targets, you can do it differently in different states. And so you might have one state say you, the consultation process must be, and be very uh, 
authoritative, very kind of detailed in how the consultation process would go. In another country, the consultation process will be much more generally described. So it's, it, it, it can vary quite a bit from state to state. So I'm not sure what is done in, what was done in the UK, but I, I would imagine it's, there's enough information in there to say that the consultation must be a certain amount, of consultation, it must be done in a certain way. And to be honest, the, the, what, the best way with an environmental impact assessment, if you have a project you want to do, is to go and talk to the people concerned about your project and find out what they want to do, what they want included in the environmental impact assessment. To, to define what the environmental assessment should cover is the number one task of any environmental assessment and that must be done between the people who are concerned and the people who are proposing the project together with the environmental agency and things like this people. So this is how it's, how it's done and then you agree on what the consultation process is, you agree on what the decision making process is and, and if you can't reach an agreement uh, then they can take you to court because you didn't do something that you're supposed to do. But it, it's, a, it's a relatively flexible process but it's got to be consultation it's got to be done in such a way that you avoid actually being taken to court later this is the main thing the, 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 the third pillar hangs over your head of be they will be get in fact they will be supported by by public purse public money to take you to court if you don't do it properly